hello. That music means it's time for the Money Hour. This is Harry Brown, and I'm so glad to be with you this Sunday afternoon, January 16th, 2005. I hope you had a good week, and I hope you predicted all the turns in the markets this past week and just made bundles of money. But then if you didn't, I hope you had a good week otherwise. Well, today uh, we have various things that we can talk about. One of them is what I was just listening to on the news that you probably heard also, the arguments between George Bush and the Democrats about Social Security. And it's funny, it's hard to believe that you can have such an argument going on with both sides being absolutely dead wrong, but that so often happens in politics that what you are given is a choice between two evils. And, of course, you're supposed to take the lesser of two evils and then be shocked when what you get is evil. But that's what's happening here with the Social Security argument. And I find it very, very interesting that a Democrat whose name I didn't catch, but I'm sure the announcer gave it, but I didn't catch it, said when he was complaining about Bush tinkering with the Social Security system, he was saying, in effect, that he should not mess with, quote, the most successful social program in the history of the world, end of quote. At least that's the way I wrote the quote down as quickly as I could after he said it. Social Security is the most successful social program in the history of the world. Well, since so many people's retirement is dependent on Social Security, not for everything, but for maybe a large part, a medium part, or a small part of what they have to live on when they retire, I think it's important to understand a few things about Social Security. First of all, it is not the most successful social program in the history of the world. Uh, there are, even if it was a successful program, it would be hard to say it's the most successful since every country in the Western world has some kind of social insurance program run by the government. And most of them are run the same way on what is called a pay-as-you-go system. In other words, the money comes in and it is used to pay the people whose benefits are due now, just like a Ponzi scheme. It started out to be a system whereby the money was put aside and would be used for the retirees when they retired. In other words, uh, you would be paying into the system, and that money would be put aside, and when you reach 62 or 65 or 70, whatever the retirement age is at that particular time, then the money you had put away would be there for you. It wouldn't have earned much because it would have been in nothing but government treasury bills, but at least the money would be there much like if you had put it in a bank savings account. It wouldn't have been earmarked for you, but all the people in your generation would have their money in a big pot and the money would be available. Well, it only took about four years after Social Security was started before they started stealing from it. Uh, I should say before they started stealing from the most successful social program in the history of the world. The politicians started spending the money that was coming in. They would spend it on other people's retirement. They would spend it on monuments to themselves. They would spend it on wars. They would spend it on just about anything, but they wouldn't put it away for your retirement. They didn't spend all the money that came in, so the Social Security Trust Fund, in other words, the reserves, that the Social Security system had to pay off retirees later did grow, but they didn't grow nearly as fast as was necessary to be able to pay off future obligations. So they reached points where they could see that they were not going to have enough money to pay the retirees within a few years, that this was going to uh, be a crisis coming up. So to avert that crisis, what did they do? They raised the Social Security tax. Today, you pay a 15% rate, 15.2%. Half of it is paid directly by you. The other half is paid by your employer. And the half that's paid by your employer would, of course, go to you if he didn't have to pay it to Social Security. Uh, we could spend a little time talking about why I'm so certain 
that that's the case, but let me just say that anybody that knows anything about economics knows that the employer is taking that money out of the wages, the wage money that's available for employees. And if he has to pay it to the government, then he's not going to pay it to you. If he doesn't have to pay it to the government, then either he's going to pay it to you or some competitor is going to offer to pay it to you. But one way or another, the wages will rise to cover what used to have been paid to Social Security if employers no longer had to pay that to Social Security. So you're paying 15.2%. When the system started, you were paying 2%. 1% directly and the other percent by the employer. And the tax rate has been raised seven times to head off the Social Security crisis. Now it's been quite a few years since the tax rate was increased, and so the crisis is looming even larger. An economist, three economists, named Joel Kotlikoff, Alan Auerbach, and Jagadish Cockhale, way back in the early 1990s, uh, did a study of this and found that uh, between Social Security, Medicare, government pensions, interest on the debt, and all of these liabilities that the government has piled up will require future generations to pay to the government 71% of everything they earn during their lifetime in order to cover all of the commitments the federal government has made to one person or another to redeem all the promises that have been made. The only alternative is for government to renege on many of the promises it has made. And that's probably what's going to happen at some point. Yes, there is a Social Security crisis. No, President Bush doesn't have the answer. He keeps saying that his private accounts are not going to affect Social Security's fiscal status. But the fact of the matter is you are not going to get as much money from individuals as you did before to cover the re- the promises that have made, been made to people retired now and the people who will be retiring in the next few years. So it means that a deficit is there between what is coming in and what is going out. The only answer to the Social Security crisis is for the government to sell off assets that it owns. Things like the power companies, the pipelines, the uh, oil rights, mineral rights, the unused military bases, all the government businesses that it owns. All of these other things, sell sell them all off and use the money to buy private annuities for everyone who is dependent on Social Security today and everyone who will be dependent on it in the next 15 years. That means everybody 50 or older. Now, if that is done, there probably is enough money in those assets to buy annuities for all those people. That means you no longer have to worry about the people who have been promised Social Security. They will get it. Everybody under 50 should then be relieved completely of the Social Security tax, and the Social Security system should be shut down. The most successful social program in the history of the world, as the politicians said, should be kaput. And everyone 50 or younger will be better off just not having to pay that 15%. Just putting it away somewhere, he'll get a better return than Social Security had promised to provide and probably won't provide. All right, we've got plenty of things to talk about, and if you have something you want to talk about, call 1-800-259-9231, and let's talk about it. 1-800-259-9231. This is Harry Brown. Stay tuned. This is Harry Brown. My book, Fail Safe Investing, will tell you what you need to know to create your own bulletproof investment portfolio. One that will protect you whatever the future brings. Prosperity, inflation, recession, even depression. And it will protect you without your having to predict the future or tinker with the portfolio. Best news of all, at LibertyFree.com, you can download the book for only $9.75. 
That's right, just nine seventy five. You can read the book on your computer screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. If you're tired of losing money on your investments, tired of the pressure of looking for the best investments, here's the way to have your own bulletproof portfolio, no matter how big or small your savings. To get a free sample chapter from Fail Safe Investing, just go to libertyfree.com right now. That's libertyfree.com. Well, welcome back. This is Harry Brown, and the phone number again is 1-800-259-9231. And you also can email me with a question or a comment. The address is question at harrybrown.org. Question at harrybrown.org. And let's take a phone call from Joe in Virginia. Good afternoon, Joe. Good afternoon, uh, Harry. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. What's up? Um, I'm not Social Security. I, I agree with uh, everything that you said. Uh, I'm against the concept of Social Security. Uh, and I think uh, eventually th- there's going to be a default situation with the United States. But just a hypothetical question, if you don't mind. Sure. Suppose back in 1937, when, when the system was inaugurated, uh, the decision, and this wouldn't have happened because they hated the individual, the concept of, of individual accounts w- would have been anathema to those people, but let's, that they decided to set up individual accounts for people who were paying into Social Security, both their own money and the employer's uh, contribution. And these accounts uh, were, uh, this money was dedicated to purchase uh, U.S. government security. And these were private accounts with U.S. government securities held until a person was 62 or 65, at which point they could acquire the interest, they could acquire payments, and then um, get ownership of those uh, U.S. government bonds. There would be no Social Security Administration as such, uh, very little administration cost, and um, would it have made much difference, do you think? Well, yes, it would have made uh, a lot of difference because not any money would have been diverted out of the system. Uh, so much of what we uh, see the government spending is money that's supposedly in the Social Security system. Uh, let me put it another way. What happens is that they do the accounting in such a way that Social Security is mixed in with the rest of the budget, and so when Social Security takes in more money than it has to pay out that year, the surplus uh, disappears because it is used to mix in with the regular budget and minimize the debt, uh, pardon me, the deficit. So during the 90s, when during the Clinton administration, they were talking about the fact that they had created surpluses, that there were, I forget what, two or three years of surplus. Uh, there really were no surpluses because they had just raided the Social Security Fund uh, to uh, pay Uh, to make up the deficit that existed in the general fund. And you can see this because the debt of the federal government has increased every single year. If they actually had had a surplus, the debt would have been going down during two or three of those years, but instead it just continued to go upward. And now that we actually have uh, admitted deficits, those deficits are actually larger than what we're being told because, once again, they are minimizing the deficit by rating the Social Security system. And if they had done what you said, then, of course, there would be no way to raid the Social Security system, and uh, as a result, it would be much sounder than it is today, and uh, there would be no crisis. One thing that confuses me, though, is that when uh, a government bond is purchased, uh, either by a government institution, which is, I think, uh, incestuous, uh, or, I'm sorry for the bad line, um, or, or by an individual, uh, they purchase that government bond. Doesn't that cash, that actual money, uh, immediately go into a general fund anyway? Yes. Yes, so it does. It does but... disappear. 
Yeah, the government the government issues the bonds in order to get money that it needs uh, to cover uh, the needs that it has or the expenditures that it has that aren't covered by the tax revenues. Would there be a way, uh, suppose we had the scenario that I suggested, uh, would there have been a way to protect that money that was invested in government bonds so that it was not spent, even though, it w what alternative would there have been to put it into the general fund? Well, they decided that Treasury securities were the safest thing, and so that's what Social Security should have its reserves invested in. And uh, I, I won't argue with that. That's, you know, that's a decision that was made, and uh, you can argue one way or another, but I don't think it's a, a particularly bad decision. Uh, but the only reason that there are uh, bonds issued is to cover deficits. Now, if the, the general fund was in surplus, the Social Security Administration could still buy bonds with whatever surplus it had because it could then just go in the open market and buy bonds that had been issued a year or five years or ten years before, and buy, the Social Security Administration would buy those bonds from individuals who owned them in the market, institutions that owned them, and so on. Am I answering your question? Uh, you are. I, I'm a little bit confused about how it would have been safe, though. I mean, if I just in uh, a good system, any kind of government system, I think, is it tears, it really, uh, other than economically, it tears apart the fabric of society in so many ways. I, I've talked with you about this before. It really kind of destroyed the family unit in some ways. Um, well, but, anyth anything you turn over to the government is going to be a problem because it will become a political issue, a political football, just as we heard on the newscast at the top of the hour, an opportunity for people to posture, an opportunity for people to pretend to be doing something for you, even as they may be taking things away from you, and so on. And so, obviously, it would be better off if it had never been uh, started in the first place. Well, it made it easy to kick Grandma out of the house down to Florida and, uh, you know. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, that it took away the responsibility of the family to directly take care of this. They think that the money they've given to the government is taking care of Grandma and putting her in a nursing home on her Social Security or something of that sort. But suppose in 1937 I contributed to a private uh, fund that went into uh, government securities, what then would have happened to that actual cash? Well, the cash you put in would have bought government securities. And with, where would the cash go? It would have. It could have gone either directly to the government if brand new securities were purchased, or it would have gone to individuals or institutions in the free market if the uh, bonds were purchased in the aftermarket, meaning buying bonds that had been issued earlier and now some individual was willing to sell what he had. And the best way to decide what would have been the best thing that could have been done is to simply just look at what private companies do. Uh, you buy an annuity from a private company, a uh, private insurance company, and, the, and that annuity is an account in your name, and the uh, insurance company invests in real estate or mortgages and some in the stock market and so on, usually has some kind of a diversified portfolio, and you know exactly what you are guaranteed. It isn't a question of what Congress will decide next year or the year after. You've been promised a certain amount, and if you don't get that, then it's possible that those people in the insurance company could even go to jail. I hear the music. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. All right, we'll be back in a couple of minutes. So if you've got a question or comment, 1-800-259-9231. Pardon me, 1-800-259-9231. This is Harry Brown. Stay tuned. This is Harry Brown. Have you lost money in stocks over the past few years? From 2000 through 2002, the stock market lost a third of its value. But during those three years, a bulletproof portfolio gained 9%. And over the past 34 years, such a portfolio gained an average of over 9% per year throughout periods of prosperity, inflation, and recession with no wide swings in value. My book, Fail Safe Investing, shows how you can have that kind of portfolio for yourself. 
And now you can download the book for only $9.75. You don't have to rely on alleged market wizards or stay up late worrying about your savings. Failsafe Investing will show you how to have the security that you crave. Go to libertyfree.com to see a sample chapter of Failsafe Investing and then start protecting the savings you've worked so hard to acquire. That's libertyfree.com. Well, welcome back. Glad you're here. If you want to join in, call 1-800-259-9231 and let me have your question, your comment, whatever. 1-800-259-9231 or email me, question at harrybrown.org. A little while back, a few, oh, wait a second, before we change the subject, one last thing about Social Security they have continued to raise the taxes, as I said, every time there's been a crisis, the Social Security tax has gone up. It started at 2%, now it's 15%. And we can look at other countries in Europe who have had these social insurance programs longer than the U.S. has. And those countries have also had to continually raise the tax in order to cover the increased benefits, the increased uh, commitments, promises, and to cover the fiscal irresponsibility that always results when politicians are allowed to run a fiscal program. Well, there are various rates in other countries, and I won't give you a whole bunch of them. I did uh, list a bunch of them in my book, Why Government Doesn't Work, but let me just tell you that in Italy, 56% of a worker's pay now goes to the government for Social Security taxes. Now, the worker may not realize that the tax is that high because he sees only a 9% deduction on his payroll stub. But the employer has to pay 46%. 46%. So between that and the employee's direct deduction, it comes to 56% total of a worker's pay is going to the government for Social Security taxes. Now, if the worker could get out of Social Security, then the employer get out of Social Security, if the whole system was scrapped, the employer, the worker's net pay would be 61% higher than it is now if the employer and the employee did not have to pay Social Security tax. Now, if you wonder why... Italy is not an economic giant, why it is not one of the fastest growing, economically growing countries in Europe. If you wonder why it has never stuck out the way Switzerland, Germany, and some other European countries have as an economic uh, giant, then all you have to do is to look at that social security tax. All right, now let's change the subject. Uh, A couple of weeks ago or so, I devoted the broadcast to various quotations from people, and I don't want to devote a whole broadcast to that, but there are a few that I thought I'd give you today, and maybe each week a few of them. Uh, Scott Adams, who writes the Dilbert uh, comic strip, said, Any doom that can be predicted won't happen. Why? Because there is a natural market for solutions to problems. Central planning, however, removes the incentives to solve problems and the feedback that a market naturally provides. In other words, any crisis that you can think of that might happen in the free market is going to be solved because somebody can make a profit doing it. So there's, as he says, a natural market for solutions to problems. The great economist Ludwig von Mises said, Entrepreneurial judgment cannot be bought in the market. The entrepreneurial idea that brings profits is precisely that idea which did not occur to the majority. It is not correct foresight as such that yields profits, but foresight that is better than that of the rest of the people. The prize goes to the dissenters who do not let themselves be misled 
by the errors accepted by the multitude. What makes profits emerge is the provision for future needs for which others have neglected to make adequate pr- provision. That's Ludwig von Mises in his great book, Human Action, one of the best books on economics I've ever read, but it is a little tough going. He's not the easiest writer in the world to comprehend. And he makes a good point that wherever there is uh, forecasting, it is the person who sees things differently from those in the majority. If you're going to beat the market, you can't beat it by doing what everybody else seems to know. In other words, if everybody knows there's a crisis coming in something or other, it doesn't do you any good to bet on that crisis because the price of whatever you're buying has been run up already to the point that if the crisis occurs, the net profit is going to be very small. But if you bet on something that nobody else expects to happen, then the price is going to be very low, and if you're right, you're going to get a huge profit. And on the other hand, if you're betting on what everybody expects and it doesn't happen, then you're going to get a huge fall in price and take a huge loss. But again, if you're betting on what other people do not expect to happen, it is a case that if it doesn't happen, then your loss is going to be rather small because you were able to buy whatever it is that was going to cover this very cheaply. And to take that one step further, it isn't sometimes so much the information that makes profits. It is the interpretation of the information. You may see the exact same information that everybody else sees. You may read the Wall Street Journal and Barron's, and you may log on to Internet sites and Internet blogs and where people are talking about things, and there's some information that virtually everybody has. But it is how that information is interpreted. Other people in general, most people may interpret it one way, but if you think that information has a different meaning, from what the other people have, it may represent an opportunity to speculate. Because here again, you're going, to be, you're going to be buying something different from what other people think is going to profit from this information. And so you're going to be, buy what you buy cheaply while they're buying what they buy expensively. If it turns out you're right, they're going to take big losses when what they bought doesn't pay off and they bought very, very expensively, and you are going to have big profits because you bought this thing cheaply. And if it goes the other way, if it turns out they're right, then they will make small profits, and you will have a small loss on it. So we come back to the same point, which is that if you're going to speculate, you've got to be going against the market. You're only going to beat the market if you are doing things that other people think are wrong. And that's not easy to do, mainly, uh, partly because so many people will tell you that this plan that they have is the opposite of what other people are going to do, that they are contrary to the market, when in fact they are saying the same thing that many, many other people are saying. We see that with a lot of trends. Oh, the stock market is ready to take off, or gold is about to shoot upward, or whatever it may be. All right, we'll talk more about this and other things when we come back. Phone number, if you want to call, is 1-800-259-9231. This is Harry Brown. Welcome back. Harry Brown here. And before the break, I was talking about what you have to do to beat the market. You have to be a dissenter. You have to be someone who is going against the crowd. And part of the problem in going against the crowd is that if you rely on newsletters and tips and so forth, you can be told that what you're doing is going against the crowd when, in fact, you may be doing what 
uh, a great many people in the market are doing because a great many advisors are saying we're going against the crowd on this when in fact all of their competitors are saying much the same thing. I believe that uh, the most crowded area in the world may be that lonely corner that uh, investment advisors claim to be in when they say they're going against the crowd. Now, if you're a new listener to this show, you should know that I believe you should speculate. That is, try to beat the market only with money that you can afford to lose. That the money that's precious to you should never be used to try to beat the market, which is the definition of speculating. When you invest, you are accepting the return that is available to everyone. And ways of investing, for instance, would be in an S&P 500 index mutual fund that goes up and down exactly as the stock market does. Or to uh, be in U.S. Treasury bills, accepting the return that is available to anybody else that buys U.S. Treasury bills. Or having money in a bank, accepting the return that banks are paying to everybody else. And uh, another way to do this is to have a balanced and diversified portfolio, what I call a permanent portfolio, that you buy and make sure that it's protected against anything that might come and can show a small profit year after year, uh, but you don't fiddle with it, you don't change it as you think the market is changing uh, because you recognize that you have no ability to forecast the future despite the fact that the world is full of people who say they can forecast the future. And uh, I, my recommended portfolio is 25% each in stocks, bonds, gold, and cash. But you may come to a different conclusion. Now, again, I want to say then that all these uh, discussions and remarks having to do with beating the market apply only to speculative money, the money you can afford to lose. The money that is precious to you should be confined to straight investing in a diversified portfolio, according to my recommendation, but if you're not going to do that, at least have the money that is precious to you in, in areas where you are not trying to beat the market. Let's take a couple more good quotations that I have seen. Doug Casey once said, The only thing anybody knows about predicting, even if you gussy up the concept by calling it forecasting, the only thing anybody knows about predicting are, number one, predict often, and two, never give both the time and the event. I think he was thinking there of investment advisors, and there are a lot of them that operate that way. Uh, They make a lot of predictions, and they don't tell you when or exactly how it's going to happen. And then a year later or two years later, they can reach into all those predictions that they made and find one that generally seemed to come out correctly and point to that and say, just as we told you, the market went up in October or whatever, even though no time had been predicted. And... uh, people get the impression that, well, if I listen to this guy, I'm always going to know what to be in. But Arthur Clarke, the man who wrote the book 2001 that became 2001 A Space Odyssey, the movie said, it is impossible to predict the future. All attempts to do so in any detail appear ludicrous within a very few years. And that's a very good point. I used to have a room full of file cabinets in which I housed all of the various different investment newsletters that I received. And I was receiving dozens of them. Some of them were complimentary trade-offs with my own newsletter. Some of them just came to me anyway, hoping that I would mention their newsletter in my newsletter and so on. And some of them were ones I actually subscribed to because I found them interesting. But I never threw them away. And in fact, I still have them in file boxes. But I don't have a newsletter anymore, so I don't keep newsletters when they come in. But what I wanted to say was that when I was keeping these and I had a newsletter of my own, I would go back and look at what the great forecasters had said a year or two or three before. And as Arthur Clark said, some of the forecasts looked absolutely ludicrous. 
At the time, they seemed very plausible. Yes, the federal government's going to be doing this. That means that. And that means that I am going to be able to make money if I invest this way, or if I do that, or if I, whatever it may be. Here's a great speculation. Here's a way we can make money. And then a year or two later, you look back at that forecast, and it looks absolutely ridiculous. Who in his right mind would have ever thought such a thing was going to happen? And... The reason that forecasters can continue to forecast is that 99% of the people they're forecasting to will never go back and look at what they said a year or two earlier. They will rely on the forecaster to tell them what he said a year or two earlier, and he's going to put the best possible face on what he did before. The fact of the matter is we are not robots. We are thinking human beings. We create the market, and therefore it is impossible for people to forecast precisely. This is uh, Harry Brown. We'll be back in just a minute, and I hope you don't go away. We've still got another segment to go. This is Harry Brown. You've worked too hard for your savings to risk them on somebody's grand plan to double them. Wouldn't you rather have a safe, secure portfolio, one that grows steadily each year without the wide swings in the investment markets? For 25 years, I've shown people how to have such a portfolio, one that made money the past few years rather than losing heavily. Now you can get that same help from my book, Fail Safe Investing. You can have that secure, bulletproof portfolio. You can download Failsafe Investing at LibertyFree.com for only $9.75. Then read it on your computer screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. The book can give you the security you crave without becoming a speculator or a market whiz. Go to LibertyFree.com to read a sample chapter and then start protecting your savings. Failsafe Investing can be yours tonight at LibertyFree.com. Well, welcome back. This is Harry Brown, and since this is the last segment, let me take this opportunity to thank John Harmon in Minnesota for keeping us on the air, doing a fine job of engineering this show. And I also want to thank you, by all means, for tuning in. I certainly appreciate this opportunity to talk with you every Sunday afternoon. And let's take uh, one last question that came in by email. Uh, Josh says, right now, Being a fellow financial planner, I meet many people who feel that they know something about a stock or they realize, they I guess he means they think they realize something that others have not that makes one one stock such a great investment that they want to put their entire portfolio into that stock. Right now, the hot stock seems to be serious. A few years ago, it was Krispy Kreme Donuts. The late 90s, it was all the dot-coms. And I remember back in the 80s when the hot stock was RCA because they had invented the laser disc. Yeah, the laser disc, that's right. That's like the Edsel. Uh, A great new format for uh, movies and uh, other kinds of video things, which just uh, disappeared into the down the memory hole and uh, has been well replaced by DVDs. Getting back to Josh's um, Email, each of those stocks eventually plummeted, yet people have not learned their lesson. My question is, what other hot stocks have we seen over the past couple of decades? Stocks that are so hot that people put a lot of money into them, and the stock ended up being a a dud. Uh, Well, Josh, I'm afraid I haven't been paying that much attention to the market because I am so locked into the permanent portfolio concept, and although I used to do a lot of speculating in my earlier days with money I could afford to lose, I just have lost my taste for it. So I simply don't pay that much attention to uh, the normal stream of information that's pouring through the investment markets. Uh, I, but even though I don't pay attention, I do hear a lot about Sirius. Sirius, of course, is one of these um, networks that broadcast over XM radio. XM being what mostly used in cars is the system whereby you get your 
radio feed from satellite rather than the normal broadcast airways or over a uh, TV cable system. And it is a wonderful technology, and anybody who has used Sirius or any other XM broadcasting system has probably been very delighted with it. That's a wonderful uh, thing. But everybody who has used it knows it's a wonderful thing. And so, obviously, Sirius has probably had its stock already run up to accommodate all of the growth that it's going to have in future years so that if it continues to do well the company itself it means you will make a very small profit on the stock but if it doesn't do well boy there's going to be a huge drop you should never have your entire portfolio in one thing josh of course you realize that but i know how you feel when a lot of people come to you and want to put everything in in one place That's a recipe for disaster. Thanks for listening, folks. I'll be back next week. So you come back. Come back now.